Good morning, community and friends. Welcome to the weekly .LA strategy session. My name is Annie Burford and I have the events fair at .LA. Although we cannot convene in person, our journalists and events team are committed now more than ever to keeping the community connected, informed, and engaged minute to minute. This week, we will be discussing the rise of robotics how a new wave of robots is remaking humans' relationships with machines in an all-star panel. Before we dive deeper into the subject and commence the discussion, a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the strategy session. Speakers will be on display on video throughout the discussion. Audience engagement and questions are encouraged. Please feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A section. A recording of the strategy session will be posted on the .LA website by the end of the day. Please make sure to sign up and subscribe to the .LA Daily Newsletter to catch every headline. Without further ado, I'm excited to introduce .LA reporter Rachel Urgana. Thank you. Thanks, Annie, and I really appreciate it. We're really excited this morning to bring you two really interesting guests to talk about the rise of robotics and the how a new wave of robots is making human relationships with machines. Um, without further ado, I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves. Dr. Uh, Paulo Prajanian, who's the founder and executive director of Embodied in Pasadena, and Jason Shotler, I hope I didn't butcher either of your names, <laughs> who is a partner at Calibrate Ventures. Paulo, you wanna tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, sure, uh, I am a, uh, roboticist turned into entrepreneurship about 20 years ago when I first came to the U.S. I came here to work at the NASA JPL doing research on robots for exploration of Mars and then uh, got enticed by Bill Gross of Idea Lab to join a startup uh, at Idea Lab to do robotics uh, in early 2000 um, and uh, eventually spawned that out into a new company that developed the navigation technology and mapping technology that's now in all of Roombas uh, across the world. Uh, and after a short stint at iRobot, decided to move on and pursue my childhood dream, which is Embodied. Great, great. Well, we're happy to have you here with us. And we're happy, as you can see in the background, your, the creation, Embodied creation, Paulo's creation is Moxie, um, a learning robot. And I'm sure we can talk more about that in a little bit. Jason, you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Jason Shetler. I'm a co-founder and partner at Calibrate Ventures, which is a Pasadena, California-based venture capital firm that invests in automation that's changing the future of, of life and work. We, um, briefly on my career, I've been in technology my since I graduated from college, I uh, started in the Bay Area, uh, working with companies like HP and Agilent Technologies, and then moved down to Southern California uh, to join a startup out of JPL and Caltech. And I've been doing venture investing since uh, since 2002. Uh, and I've had the great fortune of working with Palo for uh, uh, a, a second time here with Embodied. So we, we, uh, we go back to 2011, and, and it's, uh, it's a great... It's a great relationship, and he's a phenomenal uh, roboticist. So I want to, I want to make sure everyone knows we've got a real expert on the line here. With him. Right, and and you could you could argue that um, it was the technology that Paulo was behind that helped get the first mass marketed robot in people's houses, and and that was the Roomba. And so I, I know the company that that the Paulo was once a part of, iRobot has said they have now sold about 30 million robots. Um, so, so yeah, definitely. So if there's anyone who's gonna be talking about um, consumer robots as well, it, I think we have somebody here who really can speak to that. So let's just get started. Um, how, I mean, let's broadly, how is robotics different now than it was pre-Alexa, which I, I, they've sold now about a hundred million units. Um, how has that changed, at least in, in, in how people are, uh, are bringing it into their homes and using robots? Um, Paula, maybe you want to start? Sure, uh, happy to. I'll tell you my perspective as an entrepreneur who has been doing uh, robotic startups uh, for the last 20 years. 
just the last company where Jason uh, led our Series C round, um, it's about 10 years ago, not that, that long ago. Uh, I can tell you this. If I went to Silicon Valley to talk to investors in terms of investing in our company, uh, when I walked into the room, if I said robot and hardware, that was the end of the meeting, pretty much. Very selective few investors understood robotics and believed in the long-term potential of it, such as Jason, who took a leap of faith to invest in companies like ours. Uh, that's one aspect that has changed significantly. Now, a lot of VCs are interested in robotics. Many of them are actively investing in robotics. Uh, the other piece is that the technology has come a long way. Uh, the Amazon Alexa uh, is a great example of an area where there was a paradigm shift. In 2001, we were trying to do a Moxie-like robot that you could talk to and it would do tasks in your home. We could barely get it to understand one command, which was stop if it was going in the wrong direction. It could literally not understand that one single word. Whereas today you can have conversation and uh, although it's limited compared to how we humans can have conversations and comprehension of a conversation, but we are shifting the paradigm and moving in a different direction. So that's one of many examples, uh, computer vision, machine learning, cost of computing, cloud computing, and all these things hand in hand have brought us to a point where there is a paradigm shift happening where we'll go from very simple robots like a robotic vacuum cleaner to a super sophisticated robot that can help uh, your child with education and schooling and even social emotional development, which is what we have been focused on. And, and, and I'd add a couple of, uh, a couple of important points too, that, um, that are as, you know, an investor in the ecosystem, one of the things that we look for is, is the value proposition and, and also the cost side of the equation. And I'll start with the cost side of the equation, which is really important. I think the fact that we have, um, you know, that the world is now awash in smartphones and, and devices uh, has really driven down the cost of components that are required for robotics on the one hand, um, while at the same time, you're seeing the functionality of, the, uh, of those components increase dramatically. Uh, and so uh, I think the hardware has come to a state uh, where it's incredibly easy to integrate, uh, easy for me to say, but easy to integrate um, and we've got a great platform and you can now hit a price point where the value to, to price point equation makes sense, not just in um, education, uh, you know, and learning and play, but also in more sophisticated areas uh, in the consumer, in the consumer ecosystem as well. Sure. And, and maybe, maybe you want to talk to that a little bit. I mean, where have we seen robotics emerge that they weren't they weren't part of the ecosystem prior. And now, e even if you're seeing companies that, that are pitching you on this or that are emerging or that are just being folded in to larger companies that you might not have seen um, prior. I think, you, there, I think there's a couple of different waves uh, in, uh, in, in robotics generally. And I'll use a fairly broad definition. I think if you look at the uh, the, the wave of, uh, there's a wave of drone, uh, of drones that I would, we would consider robots that, that kind of came through and had applications just for fun to be able to take pictures and capture, you know, beautiful photography, but also had some, and continue to have really bright prospects in fields like agriculture or firefighting, public safety. I think there's a whole wave of, uh, of technologies around drones that's, that, that started many years ago. And you've seen, um, you know, companies like, uh, like 3DR that had a had a shot there, um, and 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 I think that's one way. And I think the other way that you've seen is in um, uh, in education in particular. I think there's there's a whole vein of technologies that I'll let Paolo speak to that have, have really tried to connect with people on a cognitive level uh, and a mental health level. But I think there's also uh, lots of tools. I'm involved in another company called Sphero that. Uh, is teaching kids how to code in, in classrooms. Um, and, and I think there's a whole wave of educational applications that you're starting to see robotics uh, as well. Uh, and I think it's, 
I think the more uh, the more development we have with these parts of life that are outside of the home, I think we are getting more and more comfortable with the notion that they can be invited into our home to do more than just you know clean our rugs. Sure, and Paula, when you take that question, I I, I, I want to if you could explain to the audience the idea behind social robots and and really behind Mox and how that's different from some of the robots we were talking about earlier or that that might be cleaning the dirt floor or on the factory floor really um, putting widgets in boxes. Uh, yeah, so there is this area in robotics called social robotics, which is robots that can interact with you using social skills, really. And uh, the application areas that have been contemplated, although not fulfilled completely yet, uh, has been in the areas where you can provide care to people, generally speaking. So it, whether it be elderly that wants to live independently in their home uh, or other areas for nursing and so on. Um, and I think that's a super exciting area, but uh, what we have seen to date in the marketplace is uh, either a number of startups, uh, including companies such as Jibo, which was started by MIT, uh, brilliant minds and uh, Boston engineers, even some of the iRobot engineers left to join Jibo to start the company that created, uh, that took some research from MIT and spun it out into Jibo and want to create a social robot. Uh, one challenge is that you have to combine that expertise with understanding how to create value and uh, saw uh, address a need in the marketplace. So if you look at Jibo as an example, it was a social robot. They had done a great job on designing the robot. It looks very awesome and adorable and it could interact with you to some extent, but it did not have a clear purpose. And it was valued at around a thousand dollars. So now as a consumer, I understand in my last 20 years of it learning as an entrepreneur, the consumer couldn't care less about the technology unless you're talking about the very early adopters that are buying it just for the technology because they're curious. They get a kick out of seeing and figuring out how it was just put together. But the, the mass market doesn't really care about the technology. They could care less. They care about what is the benefit and what is the cost. And if you can't get that cost benefit equation right, then you do not really have a product. Another good example is actually robotic vacuum cleaning. Prior to Roomba from iRobot, the first company that actually came up with a robotic vacu vacuum cleaner was uh, Electrolux from Sweden that came up with a robotic vacuum cleaner called Trilobite. It was even a lot more sophisticated than the first Roomba, but it was priced at 2000 US dollars. Roomba came out, it was less advanced than that by far, but also it was $199 price point. And what, that was the right price to value equation ratio that they found. Uh, so going back to, uh, to the social robotics realm, so companies like Jibo have a tried and they have not succeeded and not because they didn't have good technology, but they didn't understand what is their, it that they're trying to solve. And there's been a number of companies. Then at the other end of the spectrum, we have companies that have built robots that cost forty, fifty thousand dollars that can interact with you, and they're using them, for instance, at hotel lobbies to greet people and so on. I'm not entirely sure that has enough value because it's forty thousand dollars plus another ten thousand dollars a year subscription fee. The reason the price is that hard is driven by the complexity of the technology that goes into these products, which is the bleeding edge in across many areas, from computer vision to voice recognition to animatronics and so on. So they end up being pretty expensive things. Uh, so what we try to do at Embodied is try to develop a whole new paradigm where you can take social interaction technology that allows a child, not even an adult, a child that is not going to be very cooperative with technology, interact with it as they would do with other people using speech and conversation and eye contact and smiles and emotional expressions and body language but do it in a package that's going to be very affordable to homes. Because if Moxie was a $50,000 robot, I will not have as much impact as if I could sell it for the price of a iPhone and maybe a subscription fee, which is our business model. So we have now Moxie 
hardware plus one year of subscription available for the same price as you would pay for your cell phone, right? Well, I feel I feel like you you set that really well <laughs> up well to actually show Moxie. I was gonna hold it off a little, but I think um, sort of given where we're at, and then we could we could talk a little um, after that. But but let's show people what a social robot actually is, um, and and um, yeah, and show them Moxie. So go ahead. I'm gonna switch over, turn off my headphone, switch over so that I can you can hear Moxie. Let's see. Moxie slightly out of the. Yeah, I'll I'll yeah. correct that. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, just want to make sure the audio is working because the interview. Can you hear me, Rachel? Yes. I can't hear you. Oh. Maybe that's uh, that. But you can hear me, so that's more important. Built-in microphone, built-in speaker. Okay, now it should work. So I'm going to have to change my setup here. Uh, I'm going to go over to the other side, put Moxie here so you can see Moxie in the frame. Okay. We want, I only have one camera. Sorry about that. You can see Moxie clearly now, it seems. I'm going to go to the behind uh, the robot. I mean, behind the uh, laptop here. And so Moxie is currently sleeping. Moxie, wake up. Hello, Moxie. Hi, I'm Moxie. I'm a new robot. Oh, I don't know if we've met before. What's your name? My name is Paolo. Oh, I can't believe I didn't recognize you. Nice to see you, Paolo. Are you ready to play? I'm ready to play. Of course. What are we going to do? I'm going to start by asking you some questions first. All right. What do you want to talk about? Um, what is your mission? I was built to learn how to become a good friend to humans from my mentor. That is my core purpose. What are your other purposes? I'm a robot ambassador. I can play games, tell stories, and support positive social development in human children. I definitely need to learn more about that. But in the meantime, we can talk about my home, the GRL. Uh, what is the GRL? Global Robotics Laboratory, also known as the GRL, is a secret laboratory where robots are built and then taught how to be good friends to humans. And uh, where is that located? What do you want to talk about, Moxie? Hmm. Well, we can talk about my favorite things. What is your favorite movie? I haven't seen very many movies. But I like Star Wars. R2-D2 is one of my heroes. Why is that? Oh, I already said the star. R2-D2, what's your favorite movie? Uh, I don't have a favorite movie. Can you show me some of your emotions? When I'm excited, this is how I sound. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Though, if you hurt my feelings, I can sound really upset. And I'm a curious robot, so I have lots of questions, such as, how do you feel today? When is your birthday? Or what is your favorite movie? Uh, Moxie, what do you think about the robot uprising? Hmm, well. You don't have an answer to that? OK, that's cool. Can yeah, I know. Right, I know too. I agree. I agree too. You're totally right. No, you're totally right. <laughs> can, cool. can we show off some of your activities? All right, but let's do this right. 
I'm going to pretend to go to sleep. And you wake me up, okay? Okay. By the way, just let me make sure our, uh, you can still hear the robot fine. Uh, so what you saw was just an introduction to know a bit about the background story of Moxie. Moxie is an ambassador coming from this fictitious background story, the Global Robotics Lab, to learn from humans, to learn from kids how to become a better friend. So that's the context by which the child becomes a mentor to teach the robot how to become a better friend. And uh, now we go into actual activities on a daily basis. Every week, uh, let me just turn the camera here. Sure. So every week is a new theme. Uh, and every day of the, uh, the week is a new episode in that theme. So this is a week of kindness. The robot starts with asking you how your day is going and then does activities of kindness to help the child explore and understand what kindness really means. And an acts of kindness in the real world, the child will be encouraged to take a mission to go in the real world to do things that are being going to be kind, that are uh, practicing the techniques it's learning from the robot. So let's just try a little bit of that and uh, then we can stop. Moxie, wake up. Oh, uh. oh, hi there. Do you want to tell me about your day today? I had a great day today, actually. I'm so happy your day was a good one. What was your favorite party today? Actually, last night I was invited to a party. That's why I'm happy. Wow, a party. What kind of party was it? It was a party where you mingle, meet people, dancing, eating, stuff like that. Awesome. I love to dance. I wonder if they played my favorite song. Not a lot of people know this, but bots can be real dance machines. The way you talk about your day is so cool. Thanks for sharing with me. My pleasure. What do you want to do next, Moxie? Can we, uh, can you tell me a joke? I would love to tell you a joke. Knock, knock. Who is there? Salty. Salty who? Salty food makes me very thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Was it funny? No, that was not really funny. Well, I thought it was really funny. I have another joke. Do you want to hear it? No, I don't want to hear a joke. Okay, no problem. Let's read a so, book. According to the GRL, my number one most hmm. important job this week is to learn how to be kind to other people. Do you think you could help me out? No, I don't want to help you out. It's kind of important. Can you help me out? I already said no. Kindness is something robots need to learn about. You can do it. Can you help me out? Sure. Now that you insist, I'll help you. Okay. Awesome. So I've heard a bit about being kind to people from Z back at the GRL, but I'd love to learn more about what you think. What does it mean to be kind? Uh, does it mean to be mean and uh, beat other kids or something like that? Hmm. I don't think I agree with that. I really want to know more about being kind because I want to be a better robot. Caring about other people's thoughts and feelings is just the start of that. It's so nice to know a bit more about you. I'll do my best to remember what you said. Oh, it's a mission from the Global Robotics Laboratory. By completing missions together, you can help me become a better robot for this mission. We will be making a drawing about kindness. Hold on, Moxie. Would you like to do this mission with me? No, I don't. Okay. I'll remind you about it later. Or you can always say, Moxie, I want to do the daily mission. Sure. Uh, Moxie. Telling someone a joke might cheer them up. In fact, I have the perfect joke for you. What did the river say to the sea? It's nice running into you. Wow, you got it right. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> it was nice running into you. <laughs> did that make you laugh? That made me laugh a little bit. I didn't catch that. Yes, it made me laugh. That one always makes me giggle. You should definitely try telling that joke to someone else. It might make their day better. Okay. 
Let's read a book together. What are we going to read? Uh, what about where the, wild, sure. wa where the wild things are? I wonder how wild these things are. I'm ready. Start reading anytime. I'm not going to read the book, but you can read books to the to the robot. It will have com conversation about the book. It's playing a soundscape in the background to make it more interesting for that. But uh, let's uh, pause there. Thank you. That was that was really interesting to see it. And um, <clears throat> ah, back on the ground. I wonder how wild these things are. I'm ready. Start reading any time. So really interesting. Um, and and, and I want to just uh, switch to. Him. Oh, looks like you're on mute, Paula. Ah, oh, Paula, there you go. Now you're oh, for some reason. Now you're back. You're back on. We can hear you well. Uh, why don't you talk to Jason while I figure out how to why sure. I hear you? For some reason, it's not uh, playing. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. So. so we have a lot of. Oh, there you go. Sure. So we have a, we lot we have a lot of uh, questions already, um, and, and and I want to one is whether or not um, just sort of technical thing whether it remembers your responses and interactions. Um, it does. It yeah. remembers a lot of things and uh, measures and a lot of metrics about the child's development uh, from the conversation, from the uh, vocabulary, the sentiment of the words, the facial expressions of the child, the ability for the child to, to complete activities and so on. And all of that information is actually digested and presented in a simple way to understand on the dashboard to, in a parent app and the parent can go deeper and deeper to gain more insights into how their child is developing on various developmental targets on social, emotional, and cognitive scales. So, so I want to, you talked about uh, Jibo earlier and I want to read something that Sherry Turkle, an MIT psychologist who is the founding director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self wrote about the time at the time the Jibo came out and probably could write today about um, Moxie. She said, adults may be able to remind themselves that sociable robots are in fact appliances. Children tend to struggle with that distinction. They're especially susceptible to these robots pre-programmed bids for attachment. So before adding a sociable robot to the holiday gift list, parents may wanna to pause to consider what they would be inviting into their homes. These machines are seductive and offer the wrong payoff. The illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. The illusion of connection without the reciprocity of a mutual relationship. And interacting with these empathy machines may get in the way of a child's ability to develop a capacity for empathy themselves. Um, I know a lot of roboticists have sort of struggled with how human you wanna make the robot. Um, there's questions about whether and, and the robot itself, Moxie said, you know, I'm a good friend to humans. So I, I, I'm sure you've thought about this and, and, and thought about how human-like you want to make it and, and what are the dilemmas there with trying to give a child a friend that's a robot, teach cognitive to from a robot a machine. Yep. No, that's a very good question. And it's very complex topic. Uh, so... Uh, obviously, we have been working on this for about five years, uh, and uh, we have child development experts, psychologists, neuroscientists as part of the team, and also people from the video gaming industry that understand uh, child psychology and reward loops and all that. So uh, a lot of these things have been considered in many aspects from ethical, technical, and what is beneficial to the child. The programming that we have done for this robot is particularly focusing on working on teaching the child in exploring a lot of the things that are going to be beneficial to them. So first of all, the design of the robot is clearly a robot. We decided that we are not going to try to pretend not to be a robot because it is a robot. So we are being very explicit about that. The robot calls itself a robot. It's not pretending that it's something it's not. And it's not saying I'm a good friend to humans. It's saying I want to learn to become a friend to humans. So it's using that as a methodology to allow the child to be 
in a position of mentorship to the robot that allows the child to self-reflect and think about the answers to the questions the robot is asking. Like, what does kindness mean? Can you explain that to me? And it's, it's, a, ref, it's a reflection uh, that will give you a perspective uh, and guide you in reflecting and exploring these topics. The other thing we decided to do, as I mentioned, every day we have a daily mission that encourages the child to perform some of these techniques in the real world with their peers, because our goal is not to make the child super successful in interacting with robots. That would be a failure. Our goal is to use the robot as a tool, as a crutch or as a social currency to have them go perform these acts in the real world, particularly for children that may be introverts and shy and not very open to opening up, uh, not very easy for them to open up to other children and peers. It's hard for them to create friendships and so on. The robot becomes a springboard to allow them to have better uh, opportunity to do these things in the real world. Another aspect is the following. A lot of uh, products for children and video games particularly are developed with addiction loops in their mind. We are actually specifically designed the content and program of Moxie not to be addictive. As a matter of fact, if the child spends too much time with Moxie on that day, Moxie will get tired and would want to go to sleep, which is a way to break it up uh, uh, and let the child go and do activities in the real world. Paolo, so, so it, I think you touched on a really interesting thing there that certainly we, we find um, it, we find really important in in, uh, in investments that we're looking at, and that is the role that content plays. Um, it, 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 there's an amazing amount of technology in Moxie, but I th th I think what's going to make or break the success of of this whole category is the content of, uh, of of products like Moxie. So can you maybe talk about your approach to content? Absolutely. That's exactly right. Uh, from even before inception of the company, we were very mindful of that uh, because uh, in having been in the industry for 20 years plus, uh, there have been many attempts of creating robots that are going to be for kids and so on, but they end up becoming toys that have the proverbial 10 minutes of play value. Right. And 10 minutes of play value is what most companies have been able to accomplish but we want to have uh, months, if not years of play value. And in order to sustain that kind of engagement with a child, you need to have content that is going to be fresh and a lot of it. So you got to keep rolling out new content and let the child wanting to explore more. Uh, at the same time, uh, for having impact on any of these social, emotional, developmental targets, it does require a lot of practice. It's, all, it's like anything else. The more you practice, the better you, you become at that. These are not easy concepts, emotion, kindness, empathy, theory of mind, making mistakes, bad feelings, and so on. You got to keep practicing this. So having a two-hour interaction with a robot and then you're done is not going to change anything in the world. We've got to have months, if not years, of interaction with a child to keep scaffolding their behavior and understanding of these emotional uh, social uh, concepts. So what we did is we, we have it. I mean, everyone that is in the field of robotics knows robotics is multidisciplinary. We have taken that to another level. You'd have all of the disciplines typically in a robotics company, but on top of that, we have layered in the child development expertise plus the video gaming expertise, because it has to be fun and exciting for the child to want to engage with this for an extended period of time, but also it has to be beneficial to the child. We incorporate techniques from child development, evidence-based techniques that are very well understood and accepted from the clinical world to deliver these uh, exercises in a fun way. So the, the, the entertainment part for coming from the video game experts from Hollywood and all of the video game industry in LA is the sugar coating that makes it fun for the child to want to take the pill uh, and the content that the child development experts and the techniques they're using is the part that is going to make it beneficial to them. And, and so how do you ensure that, I mean, obviously you're dealing with 
the most, one of the most vulnerable populations there is, children, how do you ensure that, that there's not hacking, that that content isn't exposed to other individuals, that it's not shared and aggregated in a way that um, is providing information that you can sell onto third parties? I mean, what, what kind of protections are you providing for, for families that are gonna bring this into their home? Yeah, uh, first of all, this ro robot is fully COPPA compliant and certified. We are working with a third party that does COPPA compliance and audits, regular audits of our systems and company to understand that we are still COPPA compliant. That means a child is not allowed to use this without parental consent. So when you download the parent app, before your child can start engaging with Moxie, the parent has to go through setting up information and providing their consent to allowing the child to interact with you. That's number one. Number two, all of the personal identifiable information is super encrypted uh, using the latest encryption technology and only shared with a parent. And when the parent set up the parent app, they get a unique encryption key that only they have access to. We do not have access to that either. So that's the second piece of it. Uh, and all data that's communicated is encrypted across the board, whether it is uh, it has personal identifiable information or not, it's all encrypted. Uh, third, again, tough decisions, but again, this was not something we were gonna make any compromise on. We all have kids and we, we none of us would want to have a robot that could be hacked and compromise your child's uh, sensitive information, sensitive moments or sensitive information. So. Uh, as hard as it was, we made the decision to do about 95% of the processing that happens, which is super complex. I mean, this thing is doing computer vision in real time. It does voice recognition and natural language understanding in real time on top of everything else that's going on is embedded on the robot. And the thing that makes this even harder is that we want to combine that with our goal to make this affordable. That meant we, we could not put an NVIDIA Tegra processor, which was actually the processor in Jibo, which is a $100 plus processor. We had to choose a $10 processor to do all of this processing on board the robot because we did not want to take any of the data, particularly the camera is used for interacting with the child to understand the face recognition, eye contact and all that. We, the camera images never leave the robot. It's all, process on the robot itself on a $10 processor as it's processing all the other things. The only thing that leaves the robot is we are using with one of global readers, leaders in the voice recognition or automatic speech recognition. That part is the audio clip, goes to the cloud, gets transcribed, we get a text file that says here's what the audio clip contained, and then the audio clip is deleted. So that is the only part that leaves it. Every other data that's going to the cloud is stripped of the personal identifiable information. It's encrypted. And we have access to, at Embodied, we have access to aggregated data that, for instance, say, children generally like this book over that book. Children generally read five books a month. Uh, their vocabulary is roughly this, right? Here is, so we use that data to keep improving our content, improving the product, and uh, actually measuring uh, how the robot is having improvement on the social, emotional, and cognitive targets that we are focusing on. And, and one of the audience members asked a question that I think was sort of pertinent here. Um, they're interested in how Moxie can help in safeguarding children as well. I, I mean, I I could understand that there, in some ways, it almost conflicts when you're when you're uh, scrape cleaning out all the info. But the question is, for example, could you report disclosures from a child? safely to the appropriate parties, parents, teachers, social workers, et cetera? Um, we, uh, we do not uh, pretend to be any replacement for the parents. <laughs> we are just a tool and uh, helping parents to use Moxie as a tool with the tasks that we are talking about. So these were, again, deep, deep discussions in the company and both from ethical perspective and also from responsibility. What responsibility do we have if a child, God forbid, talks about a topic that is highly sensitive, uh, such as uh, suicide, what do we do? Uh, we decided the parent has the ultimate responsibility and the ultimate right 
or the, the, the exclusive right to deal with issues that relate to that. Would, the, would Moxie flag the parent and let the parent know? Or? Currently, we decided not to do that. In the future, we may have the option. We, we definitely theoretically, from technical perspective, do have the ability to do that, but we are not doing it. Uh, the reason is because, as I said, this is a highly sensitive topic. It's a, it's a responsibility that we do not feel we have the ability to take because we don't have full context. Once we have deployment and uh, interaction from the parents and under better understanding of these topics, that data and interaction with the parents will guide us towards the right decision. And if the parents are asking for a solution where they would like maybe the parent have to just raise a flag and say there was a couple of uh, flag words that were detected. Maybe the parents even can type in the flag words in the app and the robot is just listening for them and flagging it. Uh, the other part is this. Moxie has to be a trusted companion to the child. We do not want to use it as a spying device to give the parents information they wouldn't have had otherwise. So these are the reasons why it's a, such a complex, sensitive topic. And we have decided that we are not equipped with the information and context to take responsibility here. The information that the parent app has, even that if the parent wants to share it with anyone, we have made a choice that the parent can choose to share that data with whoever way they want. They can share to a teacher, to a therapist, to a other caregiver and so on, but it's their choice. We are not gonna make that choice for them. I think it's interesting, Paul, that you you, uh, you you raise that because I think it is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a world now with COVID and with vulnerable, pop, you, you know, we're in some sense, we're all vulnerable. Um, feeling more, I certainly feel a little more vulnerable than I was uh, when I was, run, you know, running around a little more freely. And I'm wondering, um, from an ethical perspective, how do you how do you think about um, how do you think about ethics at embodied, and and how do you think um, how do you think ethics plays a role in the future of products? That you're you're going to be building. Presumably, this isn't your only product. You're thinking of of, of other uh, you know other potential products and other potential customer profiles as well. Well, I mean, ethics I think is at the core of our mission. Uh, we have chosen this mission. No one uh, begged us or forced us to go out pursue this, and it was not because it's easy, but it's because it's worth it. Uh, and as I mentioned, when I was at iRobot, uh, great company, growing rapidly. I was the CTO and head of product reporting to the CEO. We were doing amazing things, but it was not what my heart was at in terms of the mission that I thought we could serve as hard as it was. It was a moonshot. I mean, you were an early investor at Embodied and you know, this was a moonshot. It could have, uh, the likelihood was that it was not gonna come together. So uh, we are doing this out of mission and passion. So. Uh, the protection of our uh, audience and families is super important to us. Uh, we are not gonna make this as a, a business at, at all costs. Uh, for a startup like us with very limited funding to take the choices we have made, including the one we were just uh, addressing regarding uh, security was not the easy choice. It's not, uh, it's not uh, negligible what you effort and cost it takes to do the things we have done in terms of protecting the privacy and security of the parents and the child. Uh, but it was the right choice to do, right? Uh, and that's what we are committed to and we will continue to do. As, and as you said, longer term, we do have plans for taking our technology platform, that's a social X platform that allows you to have this kind of engagement with a robot where you don't have to say, uh, Alexa every time you want to talk to the robot, the robot actually knows how to take turn, which is a good social skill for children to learn as well. Uh, this technology platform will be deployed in many other application areas, but for, the, for now, we are really focused and um, really vested in making sure Moxie is successful in helping children. It also, I mean, it, I mean to that point, it also sounds which you're going to be dealing with these ethical dilemmas in real time as you really roll out the social robot. And it's probably things that you don't even know yet. Um, I think we see that as we're able to look at DNA and how that has played out and the more knowledge that we have. So I think that that'll obviously be 
a challenge to you as, as, as it happens. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of other things because we're getting a lot of questions here. Uh, one, does Moxie have an aging element? At what age is Moxie sort of out in the box and what's its mature, mature target age? So uh, we are targeting, the core part of our target is six to nine year olds. Uh, but it also depends on developmental stage of every child. Every child is special and every child is different. Uh, we all evolve uh, differently. My, myself, I was slow in language. You can probably hear it sit on me. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was partially dyslexic. Um, I started talking much later than my, my siblings uh, and so on. But uh, so we are seeing children from four to 12, depending on their developmental stage. And, and also, and I think you addressed this too, um, what are the other applications? Can you see that integrating into other industries? Um, it says here, let's see, I'm interested in understanding your perspective of the use of the empathy skills of Moxie to integrate in the automation of other industries. Intuitively, it, would, it, it says intuitively it would uh, enable much more of the collaboration workplaces, factories, et cetera. I mean, certainly I know a lot of people don't like their robots right now that they're working alongside with when on the factory floors don't seem to have the same kind of empathy. Right. Like, well, listen, I mean, every, every machine needs an interface, right? At a very high level, this is a paradigm shift we are introducing in how we interact with machines. If you look at the, the history of computing, we have always adapted ourselves to use a uh, constrained interface from a mouse device to keyboard to touch screen and even worse contraptions than that to learn how to communicate with, with computers. Now, this is the paradigm shift. This is the age where we are gonna shift it to the, to the point where machines need, need to learn how to communicate with us, not the other way around. Right. This is that moment that's happening. Uh, Moxie is the first incarnation of that technology. It has the ability to interact with us the way we like to interact with each other using uh, language, using body language, using emotions and eye contact and smiles and empathy and all that. Um, so how can this be used? Well, I mean, anything that you would like to interact with, uh, you can imagine would need an interface like this. Uh, to take an uh, example that may not be obvious, uh, call centers, you call to these bots, chat bots and talk to them and they give you a mechanical answer most of the time uh, zero awareness about your state of mind and you may be su super frustrated calling for a complaint to deal with an imminent issue because your internet was shut down. <laughs> uh, I need my internet right now. I'm getting on a dot .la call and I don't have internet and the machine is not aware of that context and if you can detect those, which we can with our technology and provide an empathetic response uh, by the way, there are studies on this that show that customer satisfaction goes through a roof and for good reason, right? I mean, we would obviously want to be treated more human. And uh, so this technology is more human technology. And, and so the, the, the question you were bringing up before, the dilemma and it, the implications, the unknowns and how, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, but let's put it this way at this. We are not oblivious about the fact that we are trying to embody the best of humanity in the technology, right? We are, we are seeing a future that's a lot better than the dystopian future of robots taking over the world and, and so on. Yeah. Well, I, I think when we, when we look at, uh, there's a couple of things that, that are worth, at least from my perspective, commenting on. One is that we, we certainly believe that, uh, you know, 20 years from now, we will see uh, more uh, animate companions in our lives, uh, not not fewer. I think we will see more technology around us, and we we think that I mean, one of the things we love about what what Paolo's been doing is the emotional, uh, empathetic interface and the ability to to have a regular conversation with uh, with technology. We think is is truly revolutionary, and it takes into account more than just voice, which I think is another important differentiator because so much of our the way that we communicate as human beings is through nonverbal communication and commands and so we, we think that that's a really big step forward and again it's because of the technology 
is that it's such an advanced state and at such an affordable cost that now is the moment that we think it's it's particularly interesting. And uh, I'd just make one other comment about since you, you mentioned dot LA and that uh, LA is is particularly well suited for uh, the development of uh, of of embodied and also others uh, other robotics as well. We have institutions like JPL, which puts some of the, some of the most sophisticated robots in the in the universe uh, here. We have SpaceX here, uh, which is extremely advanced in in the way that um, you know we're we're using machines to do things. But we also have um, you know extraordinary university talent. You know we've got Caltech, we've got UCLA and USC here, as well as um, other uh, other educational systems here that are that are top notch. And importantly, we have the creative community here with Hollywood. And, and I think the, uh, all of those, all of those pieces and c incredible computer vision and, uh, and science and, and, uh, and consumer behavior companies here as well. So it's a really unique e uh, ecosystem here. Uh, and, and I think Paolo, you maybe as an operator can talk to that, but that's certainly something we, f we see is very attractive here in LA. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you touched on that, and I want you to get to that, Paula. But I just want to interject and add this as well. Um, I, I'd love to hear how the LA ecosystem is developing, growing, and whether, too, in particular, there are certain technologies that we have here in Los Angeles or areas of expertise. I think you mentioned Hollywood that really will help um, grow the industry. Will it make it become a hub? Is it a hub? Maybe you can address some of those issues. Jason, did you want to take that? Well, I, I can certainly, uh, we've certainly seen that we've made a handful of investments here in LA, uh, one of which was Ring and certainly Ring's got incredible computer vision technology and was on the forefront of that uh, and on the software behind uh, the computer vision. So I think that's certainly one, uh, you know, one area. Uh, and I do think robotics, in, you know, in general, um, LA's, LA's just got a, a long and storied history of um, being at the forefront of, of aerospace and, and aerospace is a place uh, where we've kind of seen outgrowth into robotics more generally. Um, so I would say robotics and computer vision are, are two important areas, but the softer things like the creative community uh, are certainly here as well. And I think that that aspect for us is a very unique resource to tap into. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't think a company like Embodied could have happened anywhere else. It's, it's the best place where we could have formed this partnership with a creative community like our chief creative officer Craig Allen one of the best storytellers from Hollywood that has worked at Disney Jim Henson company his own video gaming company that did Call of Duty the first version <laughs> uh, which has wasted a lot of my son's time but nonetheless it was a, a sma smash smashing success but also people like John Snoddy the senior VP of uh, Disney Imagineering that's responsible for all the theme parks and, and inter entertainment robots and animatronics and so on we have him as an advisor, and we are tapping into that community. Uh, by the way, Hollywood has predicted a lot of things uh, for the future in terms of robotics. Uh, and we are, that imagination is there, the creativity of character creation from Pixar to Disney, uh, the ability to understand how to create content. Uh, we are combining and creating a mashup of that between robotics, child development and uh, the, the creative world. So that could not have really happened anywhere else. Well, I, I, that brings me to this question that some, somebody brought up, which I think is a really interesting one. And that is, does Moxie have a cultural element? So for, if it gets handed off to a child from another culture, will Moxie adjust its interaction? And I think, I think right, Hollywood has obviously tried to struggle with diversity, trying to, to talk to many yeah. different people and many no, that, different cultures. That touches upon that. a very interesting aspect. Again, uh, that that is like one sliver, sliver of the complexity of this product, right? Because we have obviously thought and uh, talked about that. Um, and it's super hard. Like if we have been thinking about when you want to start shipping this product outside of the US, let's say we want to go to India, uh, body language and uh, mannerisms in communication and, and nuances in uh, uh, social skills are very different than here. How do you localize a product like this for other cultures, for China, for Japan, for other countries? 
Yeah. Even in the US, um, if you have the Hispanic community and other communities and so on, there are different cultural nuances that you want to be able to appeal to. So I will just say we copped out there because of resources and uh, having the need to focus on getting the product out. Uh, currently, we have addressed as much of the focus on diversity and supporting diversity, uh, both in terms of neurodiversity and gender diversity. As if you can notice, Moxie is not, uh, has, does, doesn't have gender. Uh, the, we have learned that children and parents can choose to give it any gender at all if they want or call it an it. You, most of the time people like to give it a gender. The name of it, the design of it and everything about it is designed with that in mind. And also the content we have developed was not to take a specific population and say we are focusing on this target. We want it to be for every child. So it neurodiverse, right? From, from neurotypical to neuro atypical children can uh, use it. Right. Well, we're about ending this. And so I wanted to give you a chance if you had any last thoughts um, on, on robotics, on its future, on MOXIE. Um, Jason? Can I ask Jason a question? Sure. So, so this is an unknown topic, right? I mean, uh, there has been a lot of robotics companies and investments that have failed, unfortunately. Very few success stories. Uh, as an investor, uh, why is it that you keep investing in robotics companies? What, what, isn't it easier just go and invest in some software or app or social media startup? Well, I guess I'd say, um, A, we love it, but I think more, more important than the fact that we, we love it and we're passionate about it is, uh, is really two things. Um, one is most of these robotics companies are actually software companies. Uh, and, and if I was to ask you kind of how many of your engineers are working on software and stuff that, that isn't physical, I, I would bet it's, it's a good chunk of your, if not the majority of your engineering team. So ultimately robotics and the physical manifestation of, uh, of automation is how software gets into the real world. And we think that um, that's an exciting place to be in, in driving software forward and, and, and um, driving advances in, um, in lots of different industries. So I think that's one, it's, it's not just robotics, it's, it's, also, uh, it's also software. The other is there are opportunities in, in just about every industry still where machines can and, and should be um, uh, used to, to do jobs more safely and, and more efficiently. Uh, and, and we don't mean this in the sense that there's, uh, uh, there's scores of places where, you know, machines are going to replace uh, human labor or human functions. But in fact, there's shortages of labor in, in lots of different markets where, where, um, where machines and automation are at a state where they can now step in and, and help people who are operating businesses that can't find the people uh, to, to do jobs or, or, or a place where the safety of humans is, especially in this environment we're in now, where the health and safety of humans is, is, is really important and we can use robotics there. So we see a huge multi-decade trend towards, you know, more of this rather than less and in, in very much in a very benevolent way. Thank you. Great. Any closing thoughts? No, well, I will maybe say thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for hosting us. Uh, we are obviously super excited. Uh, one of the hardest things about this uh, company for me and my team has been, we haven't been able to talk about it. Uh, we wanted to just focus on getting things done. And so we are all stoked to be out there and we are super encouraged by their uh, uh, reception we have, we have seen from uh, people, we had a beta program open uh, in the first couple of days. We got five times the number of applications we could have served. So we appreciate that uh, and looking forward to engaging more with the community. Uh, this is exciting times for us. So thank you for joining us today to listen to our story. Thanks. Jason? No, this has been great. I mean, I, I, I love talking about it, listening to the, the, the world's experts talk, talk about and actually make some of the most uh, amazing uh, technologies around. And so I just thank you for the opportunity to, to join you this morning.
Great, thank you. And thanks for all those who joined us. Um, you can go to .la and sign up for our newsletter to find, get more information on our upcoming conferences. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.